Thank you for joining us. I'm Fred Gould. I do research in applied evolutionary biology and ecology. I'm the co-director of the North Carolina State University Genetic Engineering and Society Center. And I'm pleased today to be joined by Sir Charles Godfrey, who is a professor of population biology and director of the Martin School at the University of Oxford. And we're joined in order to do a conversation all about gene drive technology, its potential benefits, the complicating factors, both for agriculture, biodiversity, and human disease. Before we dive in, I'd like to introduce Sir Charles Godfrey. As mentioned, he's the Hope Professor of Zoology at Jesus College at Oxford, and he's the director of the Oxford Martin School, and specifically the director of the Oxford Martin Program on the Future of Food. He's had an incredible academic career. I could go through his honors, but there are too many to go through all of them. I should just say that he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2001. Then he became a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2011. And then in 2017, he was knighted for his service uh, to scientific research and scientific advice to the government. But what I really wanna get at is he's not just an academic. He's a true naturalist. He cares about the environment and biodiversity. And I, I just, without embarrassing me, I need to say that at an early age, his father encouraged him in the collection of butterflies. And this seems to have turned into a dedicated lifelong uh, obsession. He has apparently identified over 500 moths and butterflies in his own home garden. This is someone who cares so much about the environment that we have on earth today. Um, he's uh, done a broad range of research and we think of him sometimes in terms of this genetics and transgenics research and such but he has over 35 publications on aphids and their parasitoids. And his PhD was actually in ecology. So in a way, he's followed in the footsteps of Darwin, linking natural history and experimental evolutionary studies. So he's a very special person. Um, so with that, I think we will start uh, some questions to get going on. Uh, evaluating these issues about gene drive. Uh, to start out, Charles, um, I'd like to go back uh, to a paper that influenced me greatly, which was your article in Science in 2010, and it's called Food Security uh, Challenges of Feeding Nine Billion People. In that article, you laid out how we might go about work towards feeding the world in the year 2050. And there was a general context to that paper, which was a bit radical at that time. And I'm gonna quote from it. It's, so the goal is no longer simply to maximize yield, but to optimize production, the environment, and justice. Today, this issue of justice is very much on everyone's mind, but at that time, it was really something that very few people were really thinking of so seriously as you were. So starting, though, with the idea of optimizing productivity, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you see as a potential for gene drive technologies in achieving that goal. Thanks very much, Fred. And before I answer your question, it's a huge pleasure to connect with you uh, at least electronically. And thank you for that overkind introduction, although I can't resist pointing out that the garden list is now 600 butterflies and moths. We're up from 500. So you asked me about productivity in agricultural systems and what gene drive uh, might contribute to that. Well, the data is still uncertain, but we probably lose 20, 30, 40%, depending on this on the system, 20, 30, 40% of our productivity to pests, including insect pests. And I think that gene drive might have a major contribution to controlling insect pests. There is a possibility though, I think at the moment it's less clear that gene drive might also be helpful in weed control and possibly even pathogen control. 
but I think it's controlling of insect pests. That is the most likely first thing that uh, gene drive could contribute towards improving agricultural productivity. I'm just wondering, are there any particular insect pests that you would see as important targets if we were going to devote effort to that? Yes, well, I think there are two considerations in choosing best targets, and one's genetic and the other is environmental. Uh, the way gene drive works is that you need the species, the target, to have a relatively normal genetic reproductive system. So there are some pests, uh, some of the white flies, some of the aphids, which either don't have sex, they're part of the genetic, or have sex relatively infrequently, and they're unlikely to be good targets. But there are others which just have sex like the vast majority of other uh, animals and plants. Uh, the other consideration is environmental. Um, you wouldn't want to apply gene drive to, a, um, to an insect that both... Uh, uh, was a pest in agricultural land, but was also part of the local ecology. So I think in particular, the targets that you would go for are introduced pests. And to give a concrete example, uh, I know because we've talked about this in the past, that we're both concerned about the um, New World moth, the fall army worm, that has gotten into Africa and is causing really major problems there. And that would be the type of insect that I think would be a potential target for gene drive. Yeah, very interesting. So, you know, the productivity issue seems, in some senses at least, straightforward. Uh, but, you know, in your uh, science paper that I alluded to before, you also talked about environment and justice. So can you think about gene drive technologies as contributing to these important aims? Yes. And um, well, consider environment first. Um, when we're trying to control pests, we're doing nasty things to the environment. We're trying to kill an organism. And so one has to think of the counterfactual. Um, and at the moment, many of the ways we use to control pests is using chemicals and often quite broad spectrum chemicals, chemicals that kill a lot of potentially beneficial insects as well. So one of the advantages of gene drive, and we'll talk about disadvantages later, but one of the advantages of gene drive is that they're hugely specific. And so potentially gene drive would be a, an alternative to using these very broad spectrum insecticides. So that would be an example of an environmental benefit. Um, justice is uh, also a really interesting concept to, as, as well. Um, the business model for most pest management at, uh, uh, at the moment is that the farmer goes and buys a, a um, insecticide, um, which he or she then uses on his or her crops. Of course, there are other means of, of doing it as well, cultural means of pest control. But um, chemical insecticides is the broad business model at, at the moment. Now, because gene drive has this capacity to self-spread through the population, you could imagine a different model where an organization that is working on behalf of the poorest farmers, the smallholder farmers, the, the, the farmers that are n right at the bottom of the, um, of the spectrum of wealth, then you could imagine the business models where this organization produces a gene drive construct targeted at an important pest, which is then released into the environment. So it could be a way by which you are providing pest control to those farmers who cannot afford pest control by typical contemporary business models. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, right? I mean, we've gone through lots of development uh, projects and technologies uh, that we have, we've sort of acted or tried to focus them on the poor uh, section. And as you say, something like 95% of farms are two hectares or less in the world, right? And, uh, you know, we think about the Green Revolution, which was supposed to be scale neutral, which turned out not to really be so scale neutral. Um, and so it's interesting to put uh, gene drives in that kind of a context. I think you brought up one of those, right, that you would be able to target this at uh, farms, but actually you'd target it at all farms, not 
even within the smaller farming community, there are farmers who are uh, better off and uh, not so well off. But this technique would, uh, I think, uh, pro provide the same kind of benefit no matter uh, what your situation was. So is there anything more that you could add on, on that? No, uh, just to agree with you there. And uh, again, it is a potential, but there is a potential if the business model is done right, that this is something that does uh, help the very poorest members of the, uh, of the farming community. So could you comment on the other side of this, that there could be another way that these things got developed uh, that might not lead to justice? Um, can you think about that? Yes. Um, one could imagine a circumstance where the development of gene drive um, was controlled by a relatively few actors who then, try, who then um, sold the technology at, um, at uh, quite high costs. Now, um, the type of gene drive you would imagine that would work under that model would be a gene drive that worked for a little bit but then failed and there are many biological reasons why that might happen so you could imagine a business model for the deployment of gene drive that is more in common with uh, that of for example an expensive insecticide and then one would begin to ask hard questions about the distributional effects of that technology both who made the money from it and whether this would lead to uh, unexpected negative economic consequences for the poorest farmers. So maybe we'll get back to that a little bit later in terms of talking about what is the obligation of researchers in, in this area to make sure that uh, these things go more in the direction of uh, equity than, than uh, lack of equity and distribution. But I'd like to move on a, a little bit here in that, um, you know, we have so far talked mostly about agriculture, but really some of the projects that are the furthest along are for human disease and others are for uh, improving biodiversity or at least stopping loss of biodiversity. So could you comment some on the use of gene drives, especially in, uh, in terms of human health? Probably the area of application where gene drive is most advanced is in controlling the insects that are the major vectors of human disease. And the project that I've been involved with, led out of Imperial College by Austin Burke, Target Malaria, is an example of this. And it's particularly targeting the major vector of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, an insect called Anopheles gambi. And here there's been really quite intensive research and the research program has gone the furthest. Um, referring back to what we've just talked about business models, the, the business model for this type of research is very much public funded and uh, done for societal benefit. So the idea behind the work is to provide a technology which, if successful and if deemed safe, would be released and would benefit the, the whole of society. Um, and there is interest at the moment largely focused on other uh, mosquitoes that transmit diseases, but one can consider it in the future going into other insects and po possibly into uh, things like ticks as well, which transmit diseases. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, conservation community is also very much interested in this. Um, within conservation, um, there is a tremendous focus on invasive uh, organisms, invasive animals in particular. Uh, after habitat modification, then probably the single greatest threat to ecosystems is invasive species. And we all know examples of this, for example, uh, mice that have been released onto islands, predators such as cats that have been released onto, uh, onto islands. Uh, I have joint English and New, New Zealand citizenship. So I know from my colleagues in New Zealand just what an effect introduced predators have had on native wildlife in New Zealand. And actually, it's not a surprise that New Zealand is one of the countries that's in, a, uh, in advance on this. Uh, it, it, it's really fascinating because the conservation community um, has many people who are very concerned about uh, genetic manipulation, but also many people who are concerned about biodiversity. 
And I think there's been some really rich discussion and dialogue as that community have grappled with the costs and benefits of this of this approach. I'm glad that you brought up some of this issue about uh, risk, because that was going to be the next question I was going to ask about, because certainly in the environmental community, there are some uh, folks who are really in favor of using these kind of things when they see the threat of these invasive organisms, but others who are strongly opposed to the use of uh, genetic engineering in any form for use in conservation of the natural world. And then again, there's also um, some organizations who are opposed to using gene drive in the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. So could you talk about, you know, what you think their concerns are, both at the environmental level and more so also, I guess, at the um, ideas of ethical kinds of considerations? Yes. Uh, the, the way I think of the risks as, uh, as genetic and environmental, um, and on top of the, the actual risk, there is a, a, a philosophical standing that um, we just don't know enough to, um, to manipulate uh, nature in the way that gene drive does. And that's a sort of position that is a set position that is not affected by the arguments for risk. And I respect that, although I disagree with it. But I think that's a, a sort of a, an absolutist position. If one thinks of the specific risks, then within uh, genetics, the concern is that the um, construct that you have introduced into your target organism that spreads might jump outside the organism or group of organisms that you um, that you uh, are targeting, and that is something that should be looked at extremely carefully, um, and is it, it is a decision that should not be decided by someone like me who's actually involved in the research. It should be decided by a completely uh, independent panel. Um, there are some related risks that if you are manipulating an insect like a mosquito, which then sticks its um, um, proboscis into uh, a human, you might have some direct worries there about allergenicity or something like that. I guess one would also worry about if one was manipulating a uh, agricultural pest that um, the body or part of the body could enter into the food chain. So there are some specific things that can be looked at there, although those type of uh, risks are relatively easy to, um, to uh, uh, assess. Um, and then the, the environmental risks. And the environmental risks are the possibility that there might be unexpected untoward ecological effects of removing a species from a uh, community. Uh, I should say you could you use gene drive, you can use gene drive to suppress a pest or to uh, change its genetic makeup. I think our conversation is largely on agriculture and we're largely thinking about suppression. One of the reasons I think that the, uh, at, at least the most likely targets of gene drive in agriculture is invasive species is there one has less worry about the untoward environmental effects because these are species that have been introduced into a region that are causing probably negative environmental effects and so getting rid of them is likely to have co-benefits for both the agricultural system and the local uh, environmental system. So th there are um, risks there, they need to be looked at uh, very carefully and they need to be looked at independently. I, I would say, uh, you were kind enough to say in your introduction uh, about that I have a background in biodiversity and I care deeply about uh, the protection of, of biodiversity. I guess one of the reasons why I'm optimistic about the demonstration of the genetic safety of gene drive is that this is a manipulation that is going against Darwin. So what you're doing is you're trying to reduce fitness you're trying to uh, suppress a population. So you're introducing one gene that does this. And Darwin Natural Selection is operating on the rest of the genome to counteract that. So all the headwinds, all the forces of natural selection in the wild are actually trying to frustrate your ability to drive the pest numbers down. 
And to me, that gives me some comfort that actually the challenges for the application of gene drive will be avoiding resistance rather than you have a rampant too successful gene drive. But as I said, and I, I, I really do mean this, it shouldn't be those of us in the field involved in the research who make these decisions about safety. It needs to be done by informed people outside our world. Well, thank you. You know, I, I really appreciate your comment about it should be done by an independent group, but it's wonderful to listen to you talk about this and to hear your own individual perspectives, because I can't think of anyone who cares more about biodiversity uh, in this world. So um, I, th I think that's very helpful for people to hear uh, what's gone through your thinking uh, in, in this regard. But you also bring up about us going against natural selection. And I guess this again leads to another question about where are we, you know, in the pipeline for developing these things, moving from the laboratory to the field? And uh, what are your thoughts about uh, where we're going to be in the next 10 years in terms of success against uh, natural selection? Well, I, I can really only talk about um, the work that I've been involved in, and in particular, the Target Malaria Project, which, as I said, is led, led by Austin Burt out of uh, Imperial College in, in London. And um, it's been really exciting, that work. Um, there is now proof of principle that uh, gene drive can suppress mosquito populations within a, uh, within a big laboratory cage. Um, what has also been shown is that when you put a gene drive through a mosquito population, then you do get resistance arising. And I think currently at the moment, there is fascinating and important detailed molecular work to pick particular combinations of the genetic construct you're using to drive the gene through and the target of that genetic construct to minimize the probability of resistance arising. So this is very much work in progress, but everything's going in, in the right direction. And if I was to sort of look into a crystal ball, I would say that within a time period of five to 10 years, it would be possible to do gene drive in anger in sub-Saharan Africa to try and reduce Anopheles Gambia if there is societal license to operate. So I think the other side of the project, uh, which involves actually many more people than the molecular biologists interested in the gene drive, is building capacity within sub-Saharan Africa to work with gene drive, to work with these uh, molecular constructs. And also, and sort of out with the project as well, to build capacity within uh, sub-Saharan Africa to regulate gene drive in an informed and uh, important way. And as part of the project, then uh, with our partners, in particular in Burkina Faso, then uh, genetically manipulated but non-drive mosquitoes are already in Burkina Faso and just looking at issues around containment and looking at issues around how that is regulated properly. Yeah, I think that's amazing that it's gone that far. And, and it, I, I have to say, I mean, the idea of releasing uh, mosquitoes that will over time disappear from the system because of the way they've been engineered is, is an interesting way of just trying out the strategy without the idea that you release them and they go wild and, and you can't bring them back. And, and we also know, and you'll know this very well, Fred, because you've been involved in some of this research, that there are non-gene drive uh, technologies that may help in vector control um, and which don't have the autonomous spreading capacity of gene drive, but do good. So they're genetics equivalents of sterile insect release and such. And some of the experience that we'll gain from the, uh, the regulation of that type of technology, I think will be very helpful in thinking of how to regulate the uh, potentially more problematic um, technologies such as gene drive. So I, I do want to get at uh, something that you brought up, you know, about the fact that Target Malaria is doing community outreach. Um, I imagine that that can be somewhat difficult because of, in, in some sense, cultural differences in terms of how does that community understand a gene, much less gene drive? Uh, 
And, um, you know, the Imperial College group is working, I think, very in a very dedicated way. But how do you communicate? What's enough due diligence to communicate that to these communities? Yes. And who should so who should decide how much is enough? And uh, in my view, it shouldn't be us scientists from the global north. Um, Apart from the sort of sheer fun of working on the cutting edge science and the target malaria project, the other thing which is uh, absolutely wonderful about being involved in it is that really from the start, we have had these wonderful partners in sub-Saharan Africa who understand um, so much about the ecology, genetics and biology of these mosquitoes, the type of experience that you only get from sort of working in the field year after year. And certainly within the project, one very much um, w w one very much ensures that it is people from within the country who understand the complex cultural context, who lead on the critical, important process of community engagement and having informed consent from the people involved. And this th this engagement is complex because it, it it sort of both. Um, both making people aware of the potential um, issues around uh, gene drive, um, but also sometimes just uh, if you're in a country where you're losing a large fraction of your children a year to malaria, there can also be the tendency to say, just bring on anything. And so it's finding the the balance between the two that is so difficult and I think has to be led from people within region. It, it's It would be hopeless if it was led from people from Europe or North America. So Charles, I was really uh, glad to hear your comments on reaching out to the communities and how we would do that um, in Africa and how, you, how indeed the importance of Africans reaching out to Africans in this situation. Uh, but at the global level, there is opposition to using uh, gene drive in mosquitoes against malaria, but it's not really about the issue about using gene drives against malaria. It's more uh, people seeing this as a gateway to uh, the use of gene drives by big industry in agriculture and other uh, kinds of approaches. And I'm not sure, how would you address those concerns? Well, it's a really interesting and important question. And if I was to criticize my field, I think sometimes we concentrate overly on some of the technical issues and perhaps consciously or unconsciously we think that if we just sort of r repeat the technical issues, go on about safety, go on about it, uh, both genetic and environmental safety, then that will quell all the opposition and that there's a sort of simple linear progress between research going into policy. Uh, into policy. And of course, as you've just alluded to, exactly how civil society makes up its mind about new technologies is really, really complex. And I think from people within the research community, there are a number of lessons. The first is a lesson of humility that when it comes to civil society making decisions, the evidence base is important, but it's not the only thing that feeds into making up decisions. So I think a strong lesson of humility to our community is important. I think, again, as you alluded to, then discussing about some of the what might be called me uh, meta issues around power relationships within the economy, around power relationships within agriculture are just absolutely critical. And my view is that we need to have these discussions. Um, my preference is we should have these discussions directly rather than using some issues around technology almost as a... As a um, substitute argument for some of these big issues about how we want to arrange our economy, how we want to think about social justice, how we want to think about distributional questions within within an econ economy. So I think we should um, address these questions directly. I think that the research community has a role in addressing these questions, but it, almost as much as informed citizens rather than as someone bringing together some special knowledge uh, about it. Um, science is a particular and very valuable way, unique way of discovering things about the world. 
And there can be a danger, I think, of our community appropriating the authority of science to prognosticate about more general issues in economy and society. And again, I think a little bit of humility is, is called for there. And I think we also have to realise that, um, especially in a democracy, then the decision about whether a technology is, um, is introduced or not is made by um, a collective process involving people electing democratic, uh, uh, democratic um, governments. And sometimes this will go against what we want. Now, that's not an argument, I think, for the science community arguing its case as strongly as it can. And I think in particular talking about counterfactuals, because um, when one is doing something like pest control or vector control, um, everything has some effect on the environment. And then the question is, how do you do it that sort of minimizes, uh, uh, minimizes the effects? Yeah, that's very interesting and, and a very difficult problem. And it actually leads me, to, you brought up democracy, and it leads me to the uh, last question for you, which is, to me, a really tough one. And that is sort of the sort of balance between democracy and justice, right? Uh, there have been a lot of democratically decided things where justice is not served. And I guess I just want to bring up as a sort of last question, I don't know how you want to address this, but the, the issue that it, it could turn out that certain people are really impacted by this or have very strong positions on it and others care a little bit about it, but they have a vote. So what happens if there are 20 percent of people who have a strong opposition to this or 10 percent? You know, like how do you deal with making a decision when there is a minority opposition that, you know, good people can disagree for real reasons? How do you yeah. make those decisions? And I, I know that you're not going to say I'm going to make that decision, but I'd love to hear what you think. Well, the, the question you ask is really important. I, I am going to dodge it slightly and I'm going to dodge it slightly because I think what you are talking about is at, it, is at the heart of modern political theory, political economy. And these are questions that have been grappled with by people in these fields essentially from Plato down to the to the present day. Um, I guess the way I'll directly answer your question is to say, well, what are the role of scientists and the research community in ensuring an informed argument at the level of um, of political economy, at the level of of discussion within society? And I, I think that we have a number of really important roles, although we have to be very careful what role we're adopting. Now, I'm someone who actually works on gene drive, and I consider myself as an, as an informed advocate of, on gene drive. So I'm arguing um, in this uh, discussion with you, Fred, that there is a role for gene drive in um, in. Um, agricultural pest management vector control. So I'm acting as an advocate. I think that other people within the scientific community should take on a different role and should be an, uh, an ostensible, honest broker. So should look at the evidence, should try and weigh it up and should try and do so in a policy neutral way. And I think we in the science community, we have these different roles. Sometimes we're advocates, sometimes we are honest brokers. And it is right that we have these roles and we may have these roles on different things. I consider myself an advocate on gene drive, on climate change. I've been closely involved in some of the discussions on pesticides, such as neonicotinoid and pesticides, where I really try and ostensibly take a honest broker role in that. So I think our community, uh, what we can do best to help ensure that there is a mature and informed debate on these issues, which are rightfully set at the level of society, is to contribute both as advocates and as honest brokers, but to be very clear which role we're taking uh, and not involved in what my late friend Steve Rayner, a philosopher at Oxford, used to call crypto advocacy, where we would pretend to be honest brokers, but actually would be adv advocating one particular uh, position. That's such an important point. I mean, I, I do think that a lot of researchers don't realize even, you know, consciously 
that they're taking an advocacy position. And yes. I think your comment is so important for other researchers to think about. And Freddie, if I might just come in there, you were talking earlier about how we, how we in the research community can interact with the broader community. Um, that's one of the ways when it's really valuable. So when I have done projects very much in an honest broker way, uh, and then engage with on the one side industry and the other side uh, campaigning NGOs, and they're just wonderful at at um, revealing sort of uh, issues of advocacy that you didn't realise you you had. So I think that's one of the areas where the research community and the broader community can interact with them in a very positive way. Well, this has been a great conversation and Charles has a huge amount of wisdom and years of experience to uh, bring up here. I guess I would say that all of this sort of now goes under the rubric of what people call responsible innovation, not just in terms of gene drive research, but in terms of all the new technologies that are coming about. And I think that there is uh, some, uh, you know, again, a field of study looking at how do you do responsible innovation. And this is one of the soft sciences. And as a friend of mine who uh, does research in social sciences said, you know, the soft sciences are really hard. It's one thing for us to test hypotheses. It's a whole other thing when you have the human being is your uh, field of, of interest. And I think that the technology will move forward but the question is, how do we use it? And I think uh, Charles has given us some really good insights into how we as researchers could do due diligence in making sure that we're responsible in using this innovation. I would say the bottom line on gene drive is uh, it's not a magic bullet, not a silver bullet, but it is something that is potentially exciting and potentially very valuable and something that is worth investigating more time in at the moment to see whether it, it will work. But that the ultimate decision about whether it is uh, deployed or not is, um, is one that society has to make. And society needs to make that with as much information as it has, both about the technology and also about the counterfactual, about what you will do if you decide not to use gene drive. Charles, thank you so much. It's been a really fascinating dialogue and your insights are so important. Um, I also want to uh, thank the uh, Gene Drive Research Forum for uh, hosting this great conversation. Thank you, Fred. It's been a pleasure.